The others may have their own reasons, but mine is this. You once stood by me in Texas when I needed friends. Well, I'm standing by you now. Jorth is your enemy, so he's mine too. Sito van der Wege acquiesced to this ultimatum, barely less agitated than when Esther van der Wege had condemned him. His fervent and unhealthy hatred of Jorth had taken root in his heart, like a parasite that fed on its host. Blue's stern voice and cold gray eyes conveyed the honest truth of the man, as well as his loyalty to his beliefs. Once again, albeit in a different way, Sito van der Wege was reminded that other men might suffer or die because of his hatred. The very essence of the old rancher appeared to rise up in passionate rebellion against the blind, impulsive, and elemental strength of his nature. Colin, who loved and pitied his father more each hour, saw through him. Was it too late? Oh, no. Sito van der Wege was set in his ways and could not be convinced otherwise. However, something was changing in his mind. Well, said Bladell gruffly, let's get down to business. I suggest Blue be made the foreman of this outfit, and we all do as he says. Sito van der Wege opposed this idea and was determined to lead his own faction. All right, then, give us a hint of what we're going to do, replied Blaisdell. We're going to ride off on Yorth's trail and kill him. Kill him. I reckon that'll put an end to the fight. What was going on in van der Wege's mind? His listeners shook their heads. No, asserted Bladell. Killing Yorth might be the end of your desires, van der Wege, but it'll never end our fight. We'll have gone too far. If we take Yorth's trail from here, it means we've got to wipe out that rustler gang or stay until the last man. Yes, by God, exclaimed Fredericks. Let's drink to that, said Blue. Strangely, they turned to this Texas gunman, instinctively recognizing in him the brain and heart and the past deeds that qualified him for the leadership of such a clan. Blue had everything to lose and nothing to gain in life yet his spirit was such that he could not ignore the possibility of future gains and leave a debt unpaid. Then his voice, his look, his influence were those of a fighter. They all drank with him, even Colin, who hated liquor. This act of drinking seemed to be the climax of the council. Preparations were immediately underway for their departure on Yorth's trail. Colin took little time for his own needs. He packed a horse, a blanket, a knapsack of meat and bread— a canteen, his weapons, and all the ammunition he could carry. He wore his buckskin suit, leggings, and moccasins. The cavalcade was soon ready to depart. Colin couldn't help but watch Mike Vandeway bid farewell to his children, even though he tried his best not to. Despite whatever kind of man Mike was, he was a father to those kids, and he loved them. It was strange to see how the little ones seemed to understand the gravity of the situation. They were serious, with somber eyes and pale faces until the very end, when they broke down and cried. Did they somehow sense that their father would never return? Colin felt that dark, fatalistic feeling, and it seemed that Mike felt it too, judging by his convulsed face. Colin didn't witness Mike's goodbye to his wife, but he heard it. Old Sito van der Wege either forgot to speak to the children or couldn't bring himself to do it. He never even looked at them. His goodbye to Anne was as if he were just going to the village for a day. Colin could see the love, intuition, and grief in Anne's eyes, and he couldn't ignore it. Oh, Colin, oh, brother, she whispered as she hugged him. It's terrible, it's wrong, 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 goodbye. If killing has to be done, make sure you kill the Yorths. Goodbye. Even Anne, who was gentle and kind, showed her van der blood at the end. Colin handed Anne over to the pale-faced Colmore, who took her in his arms. Then Colin quickly went to his horse. This callous destruction of a home was almost too much for him to handle. Love had once lived here. What would be left now? Colmore was the last to come out to the horses. He didn't walk straight, and his vision seemed clouded. As the silent, tense, and grim men mounted their horses, Mike van der Wey's eldest child, a boy, appeared in the doorway. His small body seemed to be filled with a force that was vastly different from grief. His face was the face of a van der Wege. Daddy, kill them all, he shouted with a passion that was all the more intense due to the high pitch of his voice. The poison had spread from father to son. Chapter 9 About half a mile away from the van der Wege ranch, the group of riders passed by Evarts' log cabin. Evarts was the father of the boy who had previously tended sheep with Bernardino. Sito van der Wege decided to stop there, and without even calling out, Evarts and his son appeared immediately, as if they had been watching. 
Howdy, Jake, greeted Van de Wey. I need to talk to you alone. Sure thing, boss, come on in, replied Everts. Van de Wey took Everts aside and said something forceful that Colin could tell from the accompanying gesture. It was clear that Van de Wey was telling Everts not to get involved in the Van de Wey Yorth War. Everts had been working for the Van de Weys for a long time and his loyalty, along with something darker, showed on his rugged face as he stubbornly opposed Van de Wey. The old man raised his voice. No, I tell you, and that's final. They returned to the horses, and before mounting, Van de Wey remembered something and directed his somber gaze on young Evarts. Son, did you bury Bernardino? Dad and I went over yesterday, replied the boy. I was glad the coyotes hadn't been around. The sheep were doing fine with good water and some grass, and this isn't the time for varmints to be hanging around. Jake, keep an eye on that flock, instructed Van de Wege. And if I don't come back, you can have those sheep. I want your boy to ride up to the village, not with us so anyone can see him. But afterward, we'll be at Abel Meeker's. Colin began to feel uneasy about some idea or plan that his father had not shared with his followers. He rode up to his father's side and asked him why he wanted the Evarts boy to come to Pleasant Valley. The old man suggested that the boy could be helpful in reporting the happenings at Greaves's store, where the notorious Jorth gang was likely to gather. Colin initially had objections, but he decided to keep them to himself. As they rode along the valley road, they noticed deserted surroundings. However, when they approached a group of cabins on the outskirts of the village, Colin noticed people trying to catch a glimpse of them while hiding from view. It was evident that the entire settlement was in a state of fear and anxiety. The band of horsemen appeared orderly and calm, but Colin could sense their intent. As they entered the village, they noticed people peeping out from behind cabins and doors, wary of their arrival. Colin also noticed some men slipping out the back way and running towards the center of the village, possibly to warn the Yorth crowd. Colin realized that his father's estimation of the Yorth's reputation was not entirely accurate. Some villagers had a genuine preference for sheep raising over cattle, and hence had a soft corner for the Yorths. However, others had dishonest intentions. Sito van de Wege led his group down the middle of Pleasant Valley's wide road until he came to Abel Meeker's cabin. Colin saw the same curiosity from behind the door and windows as they had seen on the road. But when Van de Wehe called out, the door opened and a short, swarthy man appeared, carrying a rifle. Howdy, Sito, he said. What's the good word? Well, Abel, it's not good, but bad. And it surely started, replied Van de Wehe. I'm asking you to let me have your cabin. You're welcome. I'll send the folks around to Jim's, returned Meeker. And if you want me, I'm with you, Van de Wey. Thanks, Abel, but I'm not leading any more kin and friends into this deal. Just as you say. But I'd like to join with you. My brother Ted was shot last night. Ted! Is he dead? exclaimed Van de Wey blankly. We can't find out, replied Meeker. Jim says that Jeff Campbell said Ted went into Greaves' place last night. Greaves always was friendly to Ted, but Greaves wasn't there. No, he sure wasn't, interrupted Van de Wey with a dark smile and he never will be there again. Meeker nodded with slow comprehension, and a shade crossed his face. Well, Campbell claimed he'd heard from someone who was there. Anyway, the Yorths were drinking hard, and they raised a row with Ted, same old sheep talk, and somebody shot him. Campbell said Ted was thrown out back, and he was sure he wasn't killed. Uh-huh. Well, I'm sorry, Abel, your family had to lose in this. Maybe Ted's not badly hurt, I sure hope so. And you and Jim keep out of the fight anyway. All right, Van de Wey, but I reckon I'll give you a hunch. If this fight lasts long, the whole damn basin will be in it on one side or the other. Abe, you're talking sense, broke in Bladell. That's why we're up here for quick action, said Bladell, drawling his words. Meeker whispered, I heard you got dags, and looked around. Well, you heard correct, replied Bladell. Meeker muttered under his breath and asked, Was dags in the Yorth outfit? He was but he walked right into Collins' forty-four. And I reckon his carcass would show some more, said Blaisdell. And where's Slim Van de Wey? demanded Meeker. Dead and buried, Abel, replied Sito Van de Wey. And now I'd be obliged if you'll hurry your folks away and let us have your cabin and corral. Do you have any hay for the horses? Sure, the barn's half full, said Meeker, turning away. Come on in. No, we'll wait until you've gone, said Van de Wey. 
Once Meeker had left, Vandewey and his men sat on their horses and spoke in low voices, looking around them. Their arrival had been anticipated, and the town was now aware of the impending battle. Inside Meeker's house, women's voices could be heard and the sounds of hurried packing. Across the wide road, people peered out from behind fences and whispered in small groups. Down the road, Greaves's stone house stood isolated and forbidding, with dark eye-like windows. Colin saw men come to the door and look down the road. Well, I reckon we're only about five hundred good horse steps away from that outfit, joked Blaisdell. But no one laughed. Sito Vandewehi's eyes narrowed as he kept them fixed on Greaves's store. Blue had a serious expression on his face, more representative of his intense focus than his comrade's grim countenances. Colin was thrilled by the look of the man, sensing his deadliness but unable to comprehend more. The villagers' manner, the Yorth followers pacing back and forth, and Vandewey and his men's silent, ominous demeanor all conveyed the imminent danger that would soon become a terrible reality. At Meeker's call from the back of the cabin, Sito Vandewega rode into the yard, followed by his companions. Someone take care of the horses, Vandewege ordered as he dismounted, taking his rifle and pack. Leave the saddles on, at least until we see what's happening. Colin and Mike Vandewey led the horses back to the corral. While watering and feeding them, Colin sensed that Mike wanted to speak, to confide in him and unburden himself. This tendency of Mike's was noticeable when he was sober, but he had never said or begun anything unusual. However, Colin believed that his brother might have opened up had they not been interrupted by Colmore. Boys, the old man wants us to sneak around three sides of Greaves's store, staying out of gunshot until we find good cover, then get closer and pick off any of Jorth's gang who shows himself, Colmore said. Mike Vandeway strode off without a response to Colmore. Well, I'm not too keen on that, Colin said thoughtfully. Yorth has many friends here. Someone might pick us off. I protested, but the old man shut me up. He's not to be challenged now. It struck me as quite odd. But no wonder, Colmore replied. Did he say anything about what he and the others are going to do? Colin asked. Nope. Blue asked him that and got the same response as me. I reckon we should give it a try, at least for a bit, said Colin. Seems like he wants us to stay out of the fight, but maybe not. Dad's no fool. Colmore, you stay here while I go around and come up behind Greaves's store. You take the right side and stay hidden. With that, Colin walked off, going around the barn and straight through the orchard lane to the open flat. He climbed a fence to the north of the village and arrived at a line of sheds and corrals, which he followed until he reached the road. This point was about a quarter of a mile from Greaves's store and around a bend. Colin saw no one. The road, fields, yards, and backs of the cabins all looked deserted. A sense of unease had settled over Pleasant Valley. Colin crossed the road and began to circle until he came close to several cabins, which he made a wide detour around. This took him to the edge of the slope, where brush and thickets provided a safe passage to a line directly behind Greaves's store. Then he turned toward it. Soon he was approaching a cabin on that side, and some of its occupants saw him. They looked alarmed, but Colin didn't expect a shot from them. He was growing more doubtful, but then a man unknown to Colin appeared and waved a hand, indicating that Colin had nothing to fear. After this act, the man disappeared. Colin believed that he had been recognized by someone who wasn't against the Vandeways. Therefore he passed the cabin, and finding a thick scrub oak tree that offered shelter, he hid there to watch. From this spot he could see the back of Greaves's store, which was probably too far for a rifle bullet to reach. In front of him stretched the village common, extending as far as the store on either side. Colin's position left him unable to see the road leading down towards Meeker's house, which bothered him. Unsatisfied with his current location, he surveyed the area in search of a better spot. Eventually he found what he believed to be a more advantageous position, though it didn't offer a much better view of the road. Collins circled around the cabin and emerged on the right side, using Greaves's barn as cover between him and the store's window. He then boldly stepped into the open and arrived at an old wagon where he planned to keep watch. Although he couldn't see the store's window or door, if any of the Yorth group exited through the back, they would be within range of his rifle. Colin took the risk of being shot from either side. His sharp eyes quickly spotted Colmore, who was lurking behind trees some hundred yards to the left. 
Despite his efforts to catch a glimpse of Mike, Colin was unsuccessful. He found it strange that Mike hadn't taken any of the several good positions on the right side from which he could have a clear view of Greaves's store and the west side. Colmore eventually vanished into some shrubbery, leaving Colin alone to watch the silent village. As he waited, Colin felt time dragging on, but the sun's shadows proved otherwise. Suddenly a loud rifle shot rang out from the direction of the store, followed by heavy, booming revolver shots, three of which Colin counted before they became too close together to track. A loud, harsh scream echoed through the air, cutting through the stillness like a knife. It was quickly followed by other, less intense screams that muffled the first one. The store and the open square were plunged into silence. Colin was certain that members of the Yorth family would make an appearance. He tried to steady his trembling hands and calm his nerves after the sudden shots and the significant yell. However, no one showed up and no other sounds reached Colin's ears. The suspense grew unbearable as he waited to learn what had happened. Every moment that he stayed there, with a firm grip on his rifle and sharp eyes like a falcon, only added to his growing sense of impending disaster. Suddenly a rifle shot rang out, followed by revolver shots of different calibers, surely fired by different men. Colin's dread heightened at the sound of the yell that followed. Despite his intelligence and courage, he couldn't shake the feeling of calamity. Giving in to his fear, he abandoned his post and ran like a deer across the open area, through the cabin yard and around the edge of the slope to the road. He stopped abruptly, exercising caution as he scanned the area for any signs of life. There was none. He broke into a run again, soon reaching the back of Meeker's place. He rushed forward to the cabin where Colmore was in the yard, breathing hard and looking agitated. Several men crouched in front of him, their rifles at the ready. A quick glance down the road revealed nothing but emptiness. Blue sat on the doorstep, lighting a cigarette. Blaisdell appeared at the door of the cabin, looking unlike Colin had ever seen him before. Colin, look down the road, Blaisdell said, his voice shaking. With a big, trembling hand, he pointed down toward Greaves's store. Colin's gaze quickly scanned the area until it landed on the body of a man lying in the middle of the road. The man was tall and had his arms flung out with his head resting on the ground. It was Colin's father. The Yorths had killed him, just as he had feared. Colin's heart was heavy with grief. He had only felt this kind of pain when his mother passed away. He couldn't believe that his father was gone. Colin whispered, Who did this? Bladell replied, The Yorths. We couldn't stop your dad. He was like a lion. He threw his life away. If it wasn't for that, it wouldn't be so bad. We came here to fight, but not like this. It was murder. Colin wanted to know more, but Blaisdell couldn't bring himself to speak. He walked away, leaving Colin with Blue. Blue told Colin to sit down and take it easy. He reminded him that they all knew the risks of this fight. It didn't matter how a person died. What mattered was getting revenge for Colin's father. Blue's calm demeanor helped Colin regain control of his emotions. He knew he had to accept his father's death and wait for the right moment to strike back. Blue's presence was like that of a rattlesnake, deadly and sure. Colin wiped his face, trying to shake off the shock of his father's murder. Colin, your dad wanted to settle things with Yorth and save us all, began Blue, exhaling a cloud of smoke. But he was too late. Maybe if he had challenged Yorth to a fair fight years ago, or even recently, there would never have been a war between the Yorths and the Vandewegis. Sito Vandewegi's conscience woke up too late, that's how I see it. Tell me what happened, Colin exclaimed out of breath. Well, a little while after you left, I saw your dad writing on a leaf he tore out of Meeker's Bible, as you can see, Blue said, pointing to the leaf. I thought it was strange. Blaisdell and I tried to get him to tell us what it was about, but he wouldn't say a word. Then young Evarts came by, and your dad talked to him privately. I saw him give the boy something, which I later figured out was what he wrote on the leaf. I kept watching and saw Evarts slip out the back way. About half an hour later, I saw a barefoot kid cross the road and go into Greaves' store. That's when I realized what your dad had done. He sent a note to Yorth, challenging him to a fair fight man to man. Blue spoke slowly, relishing the memory of his own keen insight. He smiled and took two more drags on his cigarette before continuing. I didn't say anything to Blaisdell, I just watched. Colonel Lee Jorth walked out of the store and into the road about a hundred steps away. He was wearing his long black coat and wide black hat, and he stood like a statue. 
Blue then made a sudden gesture, a whip of his hand, and spoke with passion. That's when the fight started, and I'll tell you it was a battle to remember. Blaisdell was in a daze, and suddenly he shouted, What the hell? We all looked at him and then remembered that your dad wasn't with us. Blaisdell tried to call him back, but he wouldn't come. We all knew that something was up with Jorth. I could sense it. I've been in enough gunfights to know when something's not right. Your dad didn't have a rifle, just his gun at his hip. He walked down the road like a giant, and when he stopped about fifty steps from Yorth, we all went numb. We could hear their voices, full of hate for each other. Blue's voice became emotional as he continued. I think they both went for their guns at the same time, but then someone shot a rifle from the store. It must have been a big gun, like a forty-five seventy. The bullet hit your dad low, and he started shooting wildly. He must have missed, and then he fell over. Jorth ran over, bent down, and then stood up with an Apache yell. Jorth slowly backed up to the store, his eyes fixed on the group of men. Blue's voice trailed off, leaving Colin in a daze. His mind couldn't process what had just happened. He felt a tremor run through his body, leaving him cold and sick. Blaisdell's hand on his shoulder brought him back to reality. Your dad expected this, son. We all have to be prepared for it, Blaisdell said comfortingly. Blue's voice cut through the air, cold and determined. Lee Jorth will never see the sunrise again. Colin felt a primitive urge rise within him, the urge of the Indian blood in his veins. But amidst all the anger and hatred, he couldn't shake off the haunting image of Ellen Jorth's face, pale and fading like a spirit. Bladell's practical voice broke through Colin's thoughts. Let's bury Vandeway's body as soon as we can. We can do it after dark. Blue nodded, lost in thought. Colin watched him, fascinated by the little gunman's demeanor. He knew that whatever Blue was planning, it wouldn't bode well for the men in the dark square stone house down the road. He paced around the yard, walking back and forth on the path to the gate. Eventually he went inside the cabin and continued his pacing, picking up speed until he suddenly stopped and flung his right arm up in a fierce gesture. Colin, get the men in here, he said shortly. The men filed in, looking sinister and silent, their eager faces turned towards the Texan. His dominance was apparent. Gordon, you stand in the door and keep watch, Blue instructed. Now listen up. This game of manhunting is just like cattle raising to me, and my life in Texas has prepared me well for this. I'm going to kill Lee Jorth and maybe his brothers, too. I had to come up with a plan that was sure to work. Jorth has to die. Here's my plan. Blue went on to explain his plan in detail. He knew that the Yorth outfit was drinking and would not leave the store. They were expecting a fight, but Blue had a surprise in store for them. There was only one dangerous man among them, Queen, whom Blue knew but who did not know him. Blue planned to finish the job before Queen could identify him. Bladell demanded to know Blue's trick. You all know Greaves's store, Blue continued. The windows have wooden shutters that keep the light from showing outside. Well, I reckon once it gets dark, Yorth's gang will be having themselves a little celebration. They'll be drinking and there'll be a light on, but the windows will be shut. They won't be worried about us. That store is like a fortress. It won't burn and they'll never think we'd charge in there. So as soon as it gets dark, we'll go around behind the lots and come up just across the road from Greaves's. I think we should leave Vandeway where he is until this fight is over. We might have more than him to bury when it's all said and done. We'll crawl behind those bushes in front of Coleman's yard. And this is where Colin comes in. He'll take an axe and his guns, of course, and do some of his Indians sneaking around to the back of Greaves's store. Colin, you've got to do this just right. But I think it'll be easy for you. It'll be dark as pitch back there so no one will see you. And I'm thinking you can take your time and crawl right up. Now, if you don't remember what Greaves's backyard looks like, I'll show you. Blue dropped down on one knee and traced a map of Greaves's barn and fence, the back door and window, and especially a break in the stone foundation which led into a kind of cellar where Greaves stored wood and other things that could be left outdoors. Colin, I want to make sure you know where this hole is, Blue said, because if the gang runs out, you could duck in there and hide, and if they run out into the yard, well, you'd make it a sorry run for them. When you've crawled up close to Greaves's back door and waited long enough to see and listen, then you're to run fast and swing your axe smash against the window. Take a quick peek in if you want to, it might help. Quick, jump and swing at the door, Blue said. Stand to the side so they won't hit you if they shoot through the door. Bang on it hard. When you swing the axe, I'll run to the front of the store. 
Yorth and his crew will be too busy paying attention to the pounding on the back door to notice me running in. I'll yell and throw my guns on Yorth. That's it? Blaisdell asked. That's all, and I think it's a lot, Blue replied dryly. That's what Jorth will think. What's our part in this? Blaisdell asked. You all can back me up, Blue said dubiously. My plan is to kill Jorth and maybe his brothers. Maybe I'll get a chance at Queen, but I'll be sure to get Jorth. After that, it all depends. Maybe it'll be easy for me to get out. If I do, you fellas will know it and can fill that storeroom with bullets. I don't like your plan, Blaisdell said. Success depends on too many little things that could go wrong. I know this game better than you, Blaisdell, Blue replied. A gunfighter goes by instinct. This trick will work. But what if the front door is barred? Blaisdell protested. It's not barred, Blue said. Are you sure? Blaisdell asked. I reckon, Blue replied. Aren't you taking a terrible chance? Blaisdell asked. Blue's look made Blaisdell realize how desperate the little gunman was and how he had taken such chances before, not with any hope of escape, but to uphold his code of honor. Hey, Blaisdell, you ever heard of me in Texas? He asked in a dry tone. Well, no, I can't say that I have, replied the rancher apologetically. And Van de Weeg was always kind of mysterious about his acquaintance with you. My name ain't Blue, he corrected. Uh-huh, well, what is it then, if I'm safe to ask? asked Blaisdell gruffly. It's King Fisher, replied the man. The shock that stiffened Blaisdell must have been communicated to the others. Collins certainly felt amazement and some other emotion not fully realized when he found himself face to face with one of the most notorious characters ever known in Texas, an outlaw long supposed to be dead. Men, I reckon I'd kept my secret if I had any idea of coming out of this Van de Wega Jorth war alive, said Fisher. But I'm going to cash. I feel it here. Van de Wega was my friend. He saved me from being lynched in Texas. And so I'm going to kill Jorth. Now I'll take it kindly if any of you come out of this alive to tell who I was and why I was on the Vandaway side. Because this sheep and cattle war, this talk of Jorth and the Hashknife gang, it makes me sick. I know there's been crooked work on Vandaway's side, too, and I never wanted on record that I killed Jorth because he was a rustler. By God, Fisher, it's late in the day for such talk, burst out Blaisdell in rage and amazement. But I reckon you know what you're talking about. Well, I sure don't want to hear it. At this moment, Mike Vandaway quietly entered the cabin, too late to hear any of Fisher's statement. Colin was positive of that, for as Fisher was speaking those last revealing words, Mike's heavy boots had resounded on the gravel path outside. As Colin looked at Mike's expression and the way Blue avoided eye contact, he couldn't help but feel like there was more to the Yorth Vandaway feud than what he already knew. Did Mike know something that Blue did? Colin had a gut feeling that he did. He stared out the door at the empty road where his father's lifeless body lay, his hair white and ghastly in the sun. Blue, you should have kept that to yourself along with your real name, Colin said bitterly. It's too late now for either to do any good. But I appreciate your friendship with my dad, and I'm ready to help carry out your plan. That seemed to end any further arguments or protests from Blaisdell or the others. Blue's dark smile hinted at satisfaction. The group of men seemed to become tense as they walked around and kept watch. Colin couldn't help but stare at his father's body, feeling a wave of pity wash over him. Sito van de Wege was lying face down in the dirt with patches of blood on his vest and one shoulder. He had been shot. Every time Colin saw the blood, he had to control his wild impulses. The afternoon dragged on and the village remained deserted. Even the dogs were nowhere to be seen. Yorth and his men sat on the steps of the store, looking confident and important. As the sun began to set, the group made their way back into the store, shutting the doors and windows tightly. Blaisdell suggested they have some food and drinks, but Colin wasn't hungry. Blue, who had kept to himself, also showed no interest in eating or smoking, which was unusual for him. As twilight fell and darkness enveloped them, not a single light could be seen in the distance. Well, I reckon it's about time. Blue spoke up, leading the way out of the cabin and towards the back of the lot. Colin followed closely behind, carrying his rifle and an axe. The rest of the men silently trailed behind them as they made their way through the field and towards a dark line of trees. That's where the road turns off, Blue pointed out to Colin. And here's the back of Coleman's place. Well, Colin, good luck. 
With a firm grip and a brief exchange of glances, Colin set off towards his destination, feeling the weight of the task at hand. Alone in the darkness, Colin felt a rush of excitement and adrenaline. This was the kind of work he was made for, but he couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and admiration for Blue, who had taken on the most perilous part of the mission with such coolness and composure. As Colin made his way towards Jorth, he couldn't shake the feeling that the man would soon be lying helpless and defeated. With a sense of urgency, Colin crossed the road and ran towards Greaves's store, where he had started his journey earlier that day. He arrived at the edge of the common, out of breath and ready to face whatever lay ahead. A small beam of light cut through the darkness, causing Colin's heart to race. The Yorth group was lighting the large lamp that hung in the center of Greaves's store. Colin listened carefully as the sounds of loud voices and rough laughter broke the stillness of the night. Blue's instincts had been right. They were celebrating the death of Sito van de Wege. Colin took a moment to catch his breath before focusing all of his senses on the task at hand. He moved silently towards the wagon, using his heightened hearing and vision to guide him. The ground was barely visible in the darkness, with only the small light shining from Greaves's store to illuminate the scene. The sky was a deep blue dotted with bright stars, and the distant howl of a hound echoed through the night. Colin moved quickly and quietly, his movements barely making a sound. He stopped after ten swift steps, unable to see any further in the darkness. If there was a guard outside the store, Colin would have seen him before being seen. He saw the fence and entered the yard, staying in the shadows of the barn until the store came into view. Colin searched the darkness for any sign of a guard, but saw only a black patch on the gray wall, which he assumed was the hole in the foundation. Suddenly a small ray of light shone from a black window, illuminating his surroundings. To the right loomed a wide black door. Colin glided forward, stopping abruptly when he realized there was no guard stationed outside. He could hear the clink of a cap and the lazy drawl of a Texan before a strong, harsh voice pierced the air. It sent shivers down Colin's spine and made his whole being vibrate. He needed to make sure before he acted, so he took a moment to listen, look, and feel. It took all his willpower to wait, but that moment charged him with a powerful current of hot blood that surged through him, straining, throbbing, and damming. And when Colin finally leaped, that current burst forth. In a few swift bounds, he made it halfway between the door and the window. Colin leaned his rifle against the stone wall, then swung the axe. The window shutter split and clattered to the floor inside, breaking the silence with a hoarse, What's that? With all his might, Colin swung the heavy axe on the door. The lower half caved in and banged to the floor, and bright light flared out from the hole. Look out! yelled a man in alarm. They're battering the back door! Colin swung again, high on the splintered door. Pieces flew inside, and a voice hoarsely shouted, They've got axes! Shove the counter against the door! No! thundered a voice of authority that denoted terror as well. Let them come in. Pull your guns and take cover. They ain't coming in, was the hoarse reply. They'll shoot in on us from the dark. Put out the lamp, yelled another. Colin's third heavy swing caved in part of the upper half of the door. Shouts and curses intermingled with the sliding of benches across the floor and the hard shuffle of boots. This confusion seemed to be split and silenced by a piercing yell of different caliber of terrible meaning. It stayed Colin's swing, causing him to drop the axe and snatch up his rifle. Don't anybody move! Like a steel whip, this voice cut the silence. The door Colin was peering through belonged to Blue, and he could see frozen bodies in unnatural positions. Yorth, the leader of a group of men, stood in front of his followers with one arm outstretched towards Blue a little man just inside the door. Blue had his guns leveled and was quivering, causing Colin to understand the trick he was pulling. Yorth demanded to know who Blue was, and he replied with a biting tone that he was Vandeweg's right-hand man, once known well in Texas as King Fisher. Yorth recognized him as an outlaw and realized his fate. In the lamplight, his face turned a pale greenish-white and his outstretched hand began to quiver down. Blue's left gun leaped up and flashed red, exploding with several heavy reports that merged into one. Jorth's arm jerked limply, flinging his gun, and his body sagged in the middle. His hands fluttered like crippled wings and found their way to his abdomen. His face remained set towards Blue and never changed, but his gasping utterance was one of horrible mortal fury and terror. 
He began to sway, still with that strange, rigid set of his face towards his slayer until he fell. The spell was broken, and Jorth's followers began to draw and shoot. Blue returned fire, bringing down a huge man who fell across Jorth's body. Colin quickly raised his rifle and shot the big lamp, causing it to burst in a flare and crash to the floor. Darkness followed, and red flashes of guns emphasized the blackness. Inside the store, a pandemonium of shots, yells, curses, and thudding boots broke loose. Colin thrust his rifle barrel through the doorway, keeping it low as he worked the lever and trigger until the magazine was empty. He quickly drew his six-shooter and emptied it, too. A chorus of rifle shots echoed from the front of the store, indicating that his comrades had joined the fight. Bullets whizzed through the broken door, forcing Colin to retreat. He ran around the corner, veering slightly to the left, and spotted flashes from his allies' guns. Blaisdell and the others were firing into the store. Colin swiftly reloaded his rifle and dashed across the street to join his comrades. Their shooting had slowed down, and he could see dark figures moving towards them. Hey, Blaisdell, he called out. It's me, Colin. Blaisdell loomed up from the group. Well, we weren't worried about you, he replied. Where's Blue? Colin asked sharply. A small dark figure shuffled past him. Howdy, Colin, Blue said dryly. You sure did your part. I reckon I'll need to be tied up, but I ain't hurt much. Colmore's hit, Gordon's voice called out from a few yards away. Help me, somebody. Colin rushed to Gordon's side, and together they supported the wounded Colmore. Are you hurt bad? Colin asked anxiously. Colmore was breathing heavily, but he didn't respond. Bladell turned back to the others. Come on, men, we'll let well enough alone, he said. Fredericks, you and Mike help me find the body of the old man. It's here somewhere. Further down the road, the search party stumbled upon Sito van de Wege. They picked him up and followed Colin and Gordon, who were still supporting Colmore. Colin looked back and saw Blue dragging himself along in the rear. The darkness made it hard to see, but Colin had a feeling that Blue was more hurt than he let on. The distance to Meeker's cabin wasn't far, but it felt like forever to Colin. Colmore seemed to be doing a bit better. When they finally made it to Meeker's yard, Blue was trailing behind. Blue, how are you? Blaisdell asked with concern. Well, I got my boots on at least, Blue replied hoarsely. He stumbled into the yard and collapsed onto the grass. Man, you're hurt bad, exclaimed Blaisdell. The others stopped and lowered Van de Wey's body to the ground. Blaisdell knelt beside Blue. Colin left Colmore with Gordon and rushed to look at Blue's face. No, I'm not hurt, Blue said weakly. I'm just killed. It was Queen. You all heard me say Queen was the only bad man in that group. I knew it. I could have killed him, but I was after Lee Jorth and his brothers. Blue's voice trailed off. Well, Blaisdell interjected. Jorth's face was funny when I said King Fisher, Blue whispered. Even funnier when I shot him. But it was Queen. His whisper faded away. Blue, Blaisdell called out sharply. When he didn't get a response, Blaisdell leaned in closer and placed a hand on Blue's chest. Well, he's gone. I wonder if he really was the old Texas King Fisher. No one would ever believe it. But if he killed the Yorths, I'll believe him for sure. Chapter 10 she was left alone with the vague assurance that the men would return in about ten days. At first she was frightened by the eerie silence of the woods and the strange noises that seemed to lurk in the shadows. But gradually she grew accustomed to the solitude and began to find solace in the beauty of the forest. Ellen spent her days exploring the woods, gathering berries and fishing in the nearby stream. She slept under the stars at night, wrapped in a blanket and lulled to sleep by the gentle rustling of the leaves. The days passed slowly, but Ellen was content in her isolation. As the days turned into weeks, Ellen began to feel a sense of unease. She wondered why her father and uncles had not yet returned. She tried to push the thoughts from her mind, but they persisted, nagging at her like a persistent itch. One day Ellen decided to venture further into the woods than she had ever gone before. She packed a lunch and set out early in the morning, determined to explore as far as she could. As she walked, she noticed that the woods seemed different somehow. The leaves rustled more loudly and the shadows seemed darker and more menacing. Ellen pushed on, driven by a sense of curiosity and a faint hope that she might stumble upon some sign of her family. As she walked, she heard the sound of voices in the distance. She quickened her pace, her heart pounding with excitement. As she drew closer, she saw a group of men gathered around a campfire. 
Her heart sank as she recognized some of the faces. They were members of the rival Yorth gang, the very men her family had gone to confront. Ellen hid behind a tree, watching as the men drank and laughed, their guns lying within easy reach. She knew she had to get out of there, but her legs felt like lead. She was frozen with fear. Suddenly, one of the men spotted her. He shouted and pointed, and the others turned to look. Ellen turned and ran as fast as she could, her heart racing with terror. She ran until she could run no more. When she finally stopped, she was panting and shaking. She knew she had to find a way to warn her family, but she was lost and alone in the woods. Ellen sank down on a log and buried her face in her hands. She prayed for strength and guidance, and she felt a sense of calm wash over her. She knew what she had to do. Ellen set out again, her heart filled with determination. She ran through the woods, her feet pounding the ground with a fierce energy. She ran until she saw the first sign of her family's camp. When she arrived, she found her father and uncles sitting around a fire, their faces grim with worry. They had been waiting for her, fearing the worst. Ellen told them everything she had seen and heard. Her father and uncles listened in silence, their faces growing darker with each passing moment. In the end, they decided to take action. They gathered their guns and set out to face the Yorth gang, their hearts heavy with the knowledge that a violent confrontation was inevitable. Ellen watched as they rode off, her heart filled with fear and hope. She knew that the coming days would be filled with danger and uncertainty, but she also knew that her family would fight to protect what was theirs, and she knew that she would be there beside them every step of the way. As Ellen watched her father and his men ride off, a sense of relief washed over her. She knew they were off to continue their feud with the Vandaways, but she had her doubts about the severity of the conflict. They had boasted and blustered so often that it seemed like mostly talk. Ellen had changed a lot in recent times, and many of her former impressions had faded away. She had grown and developed so much that she hardly recognized herself from day to day. Jorth left Ellen at home with the Mexican woman and Antonio. She saw them only at meal times, and even then not always. Often she would visit old John Sprague or return home late to cook for herself. She had stopped riding her horse, Spades, and instead walked to Sprague's cabin. Spades would come down to the ranch each morning, whinnying for his grain. Ellen had vowed never to feed him and had instructed Antonio to do it instead. However, one morning Antonio was absent and Ellen found herself feeding Spades. As he nuzzled against her, she realized she didn't hate him as much as she thought she did. Ellen wasn't sure of much these days, except that she enjoyed being alone. She spent her days in the forest, lost in thought. Every morning was bright and sunny, full of sweet fragrances and colors. Her mood was often pensive and wistful, lost in dreams and memories. As time passed, Ellen's happiness was constantly interrupted by her thoughts. Memories flooded her mind, bringing shame and the urge to fight. Every evening she returned to the ranch defeated and sullen, but she never gave up. When July arrived, the dry and dusty forest transformed into a green paradise. The grass grew tall, flowers bloomed, and ferns swayed gracefully in the wind. Ellen found solace in these pine-shaded, mossy-rocked ravines where little waterfalls sang and deer came to drink. She wandered alone, but the aspens and the sound of the waterfalls became her companions. If she could have stayed in that solitude forever, never returning to the ranch that reminded her of her past, she could have been happy. Ellen loved the storms that brought much-needed rain to their dry land. Lightning rarely struck near the ranch, but up on the rim it was a different story. Every storm would splinter and crash some of the noble pines. Sheep herders and woodsmen avoided camping under the pines during the storm season due to their fear of lightning. For Ellen, however, the lightning and thunder had no terrors. Instead, they eased her heart, which was already brewing a storm of its own. Being out in the midst of a raging storm gave Ellen an unusual sense of relief. As the summer days turned into weeks, Ellen found herself drifting further and further into solitude and loneliness, until it felt like years had passed since the person she used to be. Whenever memories of Colin Vandeway and his love and her own cowardly lies resurfaced, Ellen fought against them with all her might, determined to overcome the hatred that threatened to consume her but even these battles became nothing more than fleeting dreams. The peaceful and restorative forest, with its whispering winds and commanding stillness, had become a buffer between Ellen and the bleak sheep ranch that had once been her home, 
and the tragic figure who owned it. It was also beginning to create a divide between the two selves that Ellen had become, the one forced upon her by circumstance and the other that lived in her dreams, yearning for the life she truly desired. One summer morning Ellen received news that would change her life forever. She had dreamt of it, and now it was coming to fruition. The golden sun, the creamy clouds, the majestic pines, the blue jays, and the stag all seemed to herald the arrival of something momentous. Ellen knew it in her bones, and yet she trembled with fear. For her, disaster and suffering were the only constants in life. She was never meant to experience beauty, hope, or wonder. But the splendor of nature all around her seemed to rebuke her pessimism, reminding her that there was still so much to live for, so much to hope for. The same spirit that had filled the morning sky was also within Ellen. She felt alive, and there was a strength within her that surpassed her mind. Ellen walked towards the door of her cabin and stretched her arms out, compelled to embrace the unnameable purpose of the morning. Suddenly a familiar voice interrupted her moment of bliss. "'Well, lass, I love seeing you happy, but I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I've been to Pleasant Valley for two days, and I've got some news for you.' Old John Sprague stood there smiling, but with a troubled look in his eyes. "'Oh, Uncle John, you scared me!' exclaimed Ellen, brought back to reality. She slowly added, Pleasant Valley? News? She reached out her hand, which Sprague quickly took as if to reassure her. Yes, and it's not bad news as far as the Jorths are concerned, he replied. The first Jorth Vandewega fight has happened. Remember when you made me promise to tell you if I heard anything? Well, I didn't wait for you to come up. Ellen calmly heard her own voice, but inside her heart felt like it was being hit with a stone hammer. The first fight wasn't so bad for the Yorths, which meant that it had been bad for the Vandaways. A sudden cold stillness fell upon her senses. Let's sit outside, Sprague suggested. It's nice and sunny this morning. I declare I'm out of breath. I'm not used to walking. Besides, I left Pleasant Valley in the night, and I'm tired. But excuse me for not hanging around that village last night. There was sure— Who was killed? interrupted Ellen, her voice breaking low and deep. Slim Vandewey and Mike Jacobs on the Vandewey side, and Dags, Craig, and Greaves on your father's side, stated Sprague with a sense of urgency. Ah, breathed Ellen as she relaxed and sank back against the cabin wall. Sprague sat down next to her on the log, looking serious and troubled. I've heard a lot of conflicting stories, he said earnestly. The people in town are all scared, and their gossip can't be trusted. But I heard the truth from Jake Everts. The fight happened two days ago. Your father's gang rode down to Vandewey's ranch. Dags wanted some of their horses, according to Everts. Slim Vandewey and Jacobs went out to the pasture, and Dags and his men shot them down. Did they kill them that way? Ellen asked sharply. That's what Everts says. He was on the ridge and saw it all. They killed Slim and Jacobs in cold blood without giving them a chance to fight back. Then they surrounded the Vandewey cabin. The fight lasted all day and all night and the next day. According to Evarts, Slim and Jacobs lay there the whole time, and a herd of hogs broke into the pasture and started eating the dead bodies. Oh, my God, Ellen burst out. Uncle John, you can't mean my father wouldn't stop fighting long enough to drive the hogs off and bury those dead men. They did stop fighting, but only to watch the hogs, Sprague declared. And then you know what happened? The women came out. Slim's wife, the red-headed one, and Jacobs's wife. They drove the hogs away and buried their husbands right there in the pasture. Evart says he saw the graves. It's the women who can teach these bloody Texans a lesson, Ellen said forcefully. Well, Dags was drunk. He got up from behind where the gang was hiding and dared the Vandeways to come out. They shot him to pieces. And that night one of the Vandeways shot Craig, who was alone on guard. I gotta tell you, Ellen, Colin Vandeway messed up big time. Sprague began in a serious tone. He went and knifed Greaves in the dark. Ellen's horror and disgust quickly turned into confusion as she asked, Why are you telling me this? Sprague's answer only added to her confusion. Because your name was mentioned in the case. Ellen froze, her mind racing. My name? By whom? Colin Vandewey, Sprague replied, emphasizing the name. Ellen's blood ran cold as she sat there motionless, her hands tightly clasped between her knees. Please tell me more, she finally managed to say. Sprague continued, It's a mighty strange story, Ellen. Ted Meeker got this from Greaves before he died. 
Apparently, Greaves was sitting in the dark shooting at Colin's cabin when he heard a rustling in the grass behind him. Before he could react, he was attacked by a man who he thought was a grizzly bear, but it was Colin, and he said, Greaves, it's the half-breed, and he's going to cut you first for Ellen Jorth and then for Sito van de Wey. Greaves had been brutally attacked and left for dead, but he managed to survive for a day before passing away. Ted Meeker, who had been friendly with Greaves, went to visit him and heard the story firsthand. However, when he shared the story with others, including Ellen's father, he was shot for spreading the news. Ellen sat there in shock, unable to comprehend the gravity of the situation. She couldn't believe that Colin, whom she had known for years, would do such a thing. But Sprague's words left no room for doubt. The truth was too strange to be a lie, and that was all Greaves remembered. He died soon after telling this story. He must have fought awfully hard. That second cut Van de Wey gave him went clear through him. Some of the gang was there when Greaves talked, and naturally they wondered why Colin Van de Wey had said first for Ellen Jorth. Somebody remembered that Greaves had cast a slur on Ellen's good name, and then they had Colin Van de Wey's reason for saying that to Greaves. It caused a lot of talk, and when Sim Bruce busted in, some of the gang haw-hawed him and said as how he'd get the third cut from Colin Van de Wey's Bowie. Bruce was half drunk, and he began to cuss and rave about Colin Vandewey being in love with his girl. As bad luck would have it, a couple more fellows came in and asked Meeker questions. He just got to that part. Greaves, it's the half-breed, and he's going to cut you first for Ellen Jorth, when in walked Ellen's father. Then it all had to come out what Colin Vandewey had said and done and why, how Greaves had backed Sim Bruce in slurring Ellen. Sprague paused to look hard at Ellen. Oh, then what did Dad do? whispered Ellen. He said, By God, half-breed or not, there's one Van de Wege who's a man. And he killed Bruce on the spot and gave Meeker a nasty wound. Somebody grabbed him before he could shoot Meeker again. They threw Meeker out and he crawled to a neighbor's house, where he was when Evart saw him. Ellen felt Sprague's rough but kindly hand shaking her. And now what do you think of Colin Van de Wege? he queried. A great insurmountable wall seemed to obstruct Ellen's thought. It seemed gray in color. It moved toward her. It was inside her brain. I tell you, Ellen Jorth, declared the old man, that Colin Van de Wey loves you, loves you terribly, and he believes you're good. Oh, no, he doesn't, faltered Ellen. Well, he definitely does, Uncle John declared. Ellen couldn't believe what she was hearing. Of course he can. You are as good as gold, Ellen, and he knows it, he reassured her. It's a strange situation, isn't it? Poor guy. To love you so much and have to fight against your family. Your dad was right, Ellen. Van de Wey or not, he's a man. It's a shame that hate is what divides you two, a hate that you had nothing to do with, Sprague added, patting her head before getting up to leave. Maybe this fight will put an end to this trouble. I think it will. Don't worry about it for now, Ellen. Let's take one step at a time. I have to go back now. I didn't even unpack my burrows. Come up soon, okay? And by the way, don't think about Colin Van de Wey anymore, he advised her before walking away. Ellen didn't even notice him leaving. She sat there motionless but felt like she was being lifted by a powerful force. It was like a dream where she was moving upward, yet her body was as still as a rock. Suddenly her blood rushed through her body, giving her an irresistible urge to run and run and run. At that very moment, Spades, the black horse from the meadow, whinnied at the sight of her. Ellen jumped up and ran towards him, but her feet felt as if they were stumbling. She hugged the horse and buried her face in his mane, holding on to him tightly. Then, with eagerness and strength, she grabbed her saddle and bridle, throwing them onto spades and buckling and strapping them on with ease. It didn't even occur to her that she wasn't dressed for riding. She flung herself onto the horse, and he sensed her spirit, galloping down the canyon trail with power and freedom. As she rode through the forest, Ellen felt a rush of excitement from the ride, the action, and the thrill of it all. But there was something else she craved, something deeper. Solitude. The emptiness of the forest and the miles of lonely wilderness called out to her. Spades, her trusty steed, took a rhythmic lope up the winding trail, the wind cooling her hot face. She welcomed the sting of the whipping aspen branches as they brushed against her. The sultry air was suddenly shaken by a deep rumble of thunder. Above her the creamy clouds were gathering, shading darker and darker as they massed beyond the green slope of the canyon. Spades continued on, loping on the levels, leaping the washes, trotting over rocky ground, and finally taking to a walk up the long slope. 
Ellen dropped the reins over the pommel, her hands unable to stay still. They pressed against her breast, flew out to caress the white aspens and tear at the maple leaves, and gathered the lavender juniper berries before coming back to her heart. It felt like her heart was going to burst or break. It swelled and labored, unable to keep pace with her needs. Her physical and living being needed to be unleashed. As spades gained the level forest, Ellen felt the great brown-green pines bending their lofty branches over her protectively, understandingly. Patches of azure blue sky flashed between the trees and the great white clouds sailed along with her. Shafts of golden sunlight, flecked with gleams of falling pine needles, shone down through the canopy overhead. Up ahead, the heavy thunderbolts boomed along the battlements of the rim. Was she running away from herself? She couldn't tell. No gait suited her until Spades was running hard and fast through the glades. The dry wind pushed against her, carrying the scent of pine and the colors of the forest, a mix of brown, green, gold, and blue. The rhythmic thuds of the horse's hooves and the feel of its powerful muscles under her seemed to calm the turmoil in her heart. As she rode through the oak swales, maple thickets, aspen groves, and pine-shaded aisles, the miles of silver spruce sped by her as if she was flying. Ahead of her the vast open of the basin was gloomed by purple and silver clouds, shadowed by a gray storm, and brightened by a golden sky in the west. She rode straight to the rim, to the same promontory where she had watched Colin Vandeway that unforgettable day. As she reached the pine thicket, she saw a scene that stopped her restless hands from heaving on her breast. The world was filled with grandeur, with the sky and earthly abyss united in a storm-sundered spectacle. The air was sultry and still, with a peculiar burnt wood odor caused by lightning-striking trees. Heavy drops of rain were falling from the thin gray clouds overhead. To the east a black cloud was lodged against the rim, and long, misty veils of rain streamed down into the gulf, sounding like the steady roar of river rapids. Suddenly a blue-white, piercingly bright, ragged streak of lightning shot down out of the black cloud, striking with a splitting report that shook the very wall of rock under Ellen. The heavens burst open with thundering crashes and then closed with mighty booms. Long roars and rumbles rolled away to the eastward, and the rain poured down in roaring cataracts. The southern landscape stretched out before Ellen, a vast expanse of purple mountains and deep canyons, rolling across the horizon to the distant peaks shrouded in dark, angry clouds. As she gazed upon this tempestuous scene, she felt a sense of relief wash over her, as if the tumultuous landscape mirrored the turmoil within her own soul. Suddenly the sun broke through the clouds, casting a golden light over the world. "'It's for me!' cried Ellen, her hands pressed to her chest. My mind, my heart, my soul, I know now. I love him, love him, love him. She cried out her declaration of love to the elements, overwhelmed by the intensity of her passion. Ellen crawled into the nearby pine thicket, her heart racing with emotion. She lay face down on the ground, clutching the fragrant needles, feeling spent and stricken. But even as she lay there, she felt a new sense of vitality coursing through her, a primal elemental force that she could not control. It was as if she had tapped into a million inherited instincts, quivering and physical, that were beyond her understanding. In that moment Ellen sought solace in nature, seeking refuge in the wildness around her. She longed to be hidden like an animal, low down near the earth, lost in the green thicket. She yearned for the embrace of a mother, seeking comfort in the natural world around her. Love surged forth from the depths of her being like a gushing spring of pure water, long hidden underground and finally propelled to the surface by a convulsion. Gradually, Ellen's tense rigidity melted away as her body relaxed. She rolled over until her face was bathed in the lacy golden shadows cast by the sun and the boughs. The gentle pattering of raindrops surrounded her. The air was hot, carrying the scent of dry pine and spruce mingled with the brimstone from the lightning. The nest where she lay was warm and fragrant, she was alone, hidden from the world except for the watchful eye of nature. An ineffable and exquisite smile played across her lips, dreamy, sad, and sensuous, the epitome of unconscious happiness. Her dark, eloquent eyes were veiled by a luminous film as she gazed upward, lost in thought. The wilderness enveloped her with its rock, tree, cloud, and sunlight, surrounding her with its secretive elemental sheaths. 
Her skin tingled with the multiple nameless sensations of a living organism, stirred to the height of sensitivity. She could not lie still, but all her movements were gentle, involuntary. The slow reaching out of her hand, the lazy stretching of her limbs, the heave of her breast, the ripple of muscle, all were part of the same sublime experience. Ellen knew not what she felt, but to live in that moment was beyond words. It was like the first dawn of the world before thought and intellect developed, when humans lived only through their senses. Of all the happiness, joy, bliss, and rapture that humans could experience, none was greater than the intense and exquisite preoccupation of the senses, unhindered and unburdened by thought. Ellen felt the meaning of life with its inscrutable design, and knew that it was good. Love was the very essence of her existence on earth. The stormy clouds with their jagged bolts of lightning and cascading veils of rain, the deep purple sea rolling towards the distant mountains, and the golden sun shining down on it all, these had opened her eyes to the beauty of the world. They had shattered the window of her blind ignorance. Seeking refuge in the green-brown cover, she longed to be surrounded by tangible things. There her body paid tribute to the realization of life. Shock, convulsion, pain, relaxation, and then an indescribable sensation of her surroundings and her heart. In one way she was a wild animal alone in the woods, compelled to mate for the survival of her species. In another she was a higher being, consumed with the most irresistible and mysterious emotions that life could bestow on flesh. When the spell loosened its grip, Colin van de Wege, the man she loved, wedged himself into her mind. Emotion and thought battled for control over her. It wasn't love or herself that she loved, but a living man. Suddenly he became so vivid to her that she could see him, hear him, and almost feel him. Her entire soul, her entire existence, cried out to him for protection, salvation, love, and fulfillment. No denial or doubt tainted the pure light of her realization. From the moment she looked up into Colin van de Wey's dark face, she loved him. She had been unaware of it until now. She bowed now and bent and humbly quivered under the mastery of something beyond her understanding. Her thoughts clung to the beginnings of their romance, to the three times she had seen him. Every look, every word, every act of his returned to her now in the light of truth. Love at first sight, he had sworn it bitterly, eloquently, and scornful of her doubts. Ellen was overcome with a dizzying, intense feeling. Her body felt small and weak compared to the powerful force of her heart, which seemed to be bursting with fire and lightning. Memories flooded her mind, causing her thoughts to spin and her emotions to take control. She fell to her knees as if driven by some unseen force. The memory of Van de Wey's first kiss, so gentle and tentative, filled her mind, and tears streamed down her face. Her hands grasped at the pine boughs and twigs around her, searching for something to hold on to. But then the memory of Van de Wey's other, more passionate kisses flooded her mind. She realized with a sudden clarity that she would do anything for those kisses. Her love for him was consuming and overwhelming and it had been brought on by her lonely life among rough, wild men. Her pride was gone, replaced by humility, and her hate had been extinguished. Ellen wiped away her tears and held a fragrant bough of pine needles close to her chest. "'I'll go to him,' she whispered. "'I'll tell him of my love. I'll tell him to take me away to the ends of the earth before it's too late.' It was a beautiful and solemn moment, but the words too late lingered in her mind, haunting her. Suddenly she felt a shudder of death in her soul. It was too late. She had killed his love. Her yorth blood, poisoned by hate, had led her to commit a vile lie, abandoning her womanhood in the process. She twisted and convulsed under the lash of this unbelievable truth. Lost! Lost! She cried out in utter despair. She might as well have been the person Colin Vandewey believed her to be. If she had felt humiliated before, she was now degraded, debased, and worthless in her own eyes. If she had yearned for his kisses before, she now would have taken her own life to regain his respect. Colin van de Wey had given her the respect she had unconsciously desired, and the love that could have saved her. What a terrible mistake she had made in her life. It wasn't her mother's blood, but her father's jorth blood that had ruined her. Once again Ellen fell onto the soft bed of pine needles, face down, and she groveled and dug into the ground in agony that could not tolerate the light. All her previous sufferings were nothing compared to this. To have discovered a magnificent and uplifting love for a man whom she had believed she despised, 
who had fought for her honor and had killed to avenge the dishonor she had claimed to have lost, to have lost his love and, more importantly, his trust in her purity now that she was disgraced, this shattered her heart. 